Shalom and welcome to yet another episode of TV7 Editor's Note. And today joining me in the program here in Jerusalem is my dear friend and special guest, Dr. Rafael Bardaki, Spain's former national security advisor, as well as so many other <laughs> uh, titles and positions over the years. But uh, one of uh, the very, very um, interesting positions that you hold uh, is the Friends of Israel Initiative, the executive uh, uh, director thereof. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much indeed. It's good to have you here. Uh, Rafael, I, I think it would be interesting for our viewers. Of course, they know you from Europa Stands. Uh, uh, people in Spain know you for much more. Uh, but uh, give us a little bit of uh, a brief curriculum vitae, uh, with specifically also what led you to, to launch uh, the Friends of Ish Israel Initiative from all other yeah, well, I think uh, we put together an impressive group of uh, non-Jewish uh, public figures uh, running from former Prime Minister of Canada, Steve Harper, to former Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, passing through former President of Uruguay, La Calle, or Prime Minister of Spain, uh, Jose Maria Aznar, and many others, up to almost 30 people, plus uh, 12 different ch former chief of staff or general uh, in charge of operations from all over the world, Latin America, North America, Europe, Asia, the Pacific, uh, who has something in common, is to believe that Israel is our best guarantee for the Western world in the future and in the past. Always people thought that America was our best option. I think uh, for us, Israel is our only option for the future, mm -hmm. surrounded by enemies, not only against Israel or the U.S. people, but against what the Western civilization has been. And uh, if we want to protect our common values, we need a strong, vibrant, democratic uh, Jewish state in Israel, able to defend itself, having secure borders, and able to fight the fights that the whole Western world should be doing against our common enemies. I'm afraid in the last year we have seen a lot of delegitimation of the state of Israel, a lot of attacks against the legitimacy of the system itself of the state of Israel. So we decided uh, 15 years ago to create this group to engage with peers in mostly private conversations, also in public um, speeches, just to defend the state of Israel just to defend the, the fair treatment of uh, a state like any other, uh, despite the circumstances, but the need to understand in a rational way why Israel is so vitally important for the future of the Western world. Indeed. Well, uh, it is a very unique uh, initiative that has uh, really stood up for Israel. And, and I hear from not only the appreciation here within Israel's various establishments, but also around the world, people standing for Israel have uh, a very high regard for this uh, is Friends of Israel initiative. But uh, as we always do in this program, uh, we will open with prayer and then uh, we'll dive into various uh, uh, discussion points that we deliberated prior, uh, things that also concern uh, our TV7 community, our, our family all over the world, and uh, we'll do so just uh, momentarily. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here together with uh, uh, our brother, Dr. Rafael Barahi. Uh, we pray that you will guide and lead us, each and every one of us uh, all over the world, tuning into this program, that we may uh, really focus and understand, receive the wisdom, knowledge, uh, and understanding of you to uh, comprehend the challenges at hand and understand what we may also do from ourselves uh, uh, within this context in order to fulfill your uh, mission on earth, Father. We give you all glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Rafael, today the West in general, uh, and unfortunately even here in Israel, but all over, uh, there is an ongoing battle uh, targeting families. Uh, it seems like uh, this is being uh, challenged by various institutions. Of course, uh, it has to do with multiple uh, woke ideals that have uh, emerged over the past uh, several decades as legitimate uh, things that in the past were un 
heard of or even uh, the slightest ideas were regarded as crazy <laughs> for that matter. Today, they're becoming a norm. Uh, and for them to take their place, they're, of course, attacking our Christian values, our conservative values, our uh, aspirations to live within uh, what biology dictates and uh, what uh, the, the logic uh, ultimately uh, should prevail. In this mm -hmm. situation, there is an ongoing battle, of course, there was the Wade and Roe um, um, legal angle that was uh, thankfully challenged and, and over, uh, overrun by by common sense at this stage, but we never know what's going to happen in the future. What can you tell us about that? Well, I think uh, we committed uh, uh, a mistake in the past, in the 90s, when we thought that the, after the disappearance of the Soviet Union, this uh, confrontation between liberal democratic values and the communists was over, and that the Western values, the Christian, Judean tradition and civilization won. Uh, won easily, and that started what Fukuyama said, the end of history, a new phase, or what uh, Krauthammer called the unipolar moment, in uh, geostrategic term, terms, uh, giving the superiority to the leader of the Western world, the United States of America. Uh, we didn't recognize at the time that the left wasn't dead, that the left maybe le is dead in, in, the Soviet, in the former Soviet Union, in Russia today, but it was very well alive in our universities and our educational system. And uh, what we, we have been seeing, I think, is a cultural war developed within our own societies, targeting the roots of our, and the pillars of our basic values, no? family, as you mentioned, uh, education, uh, the gender issues, uh, so everything dictating that what has been accepted as marginal but acceptable is become the majority and the normal. And the normal has been the abnorm the new abnormal. No? I think there is a dictatorship, increasing dictatorship of those minority identity groups against the majority of the people who has been too silent to my own taste in the last years that has reversed completely the foundation of our society, you know, based on tradition, history, values, uh, uh, tolerance, uh, which is, 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 is over. No? You go to the social media today and there is no more censorship there than any, anywhere in the past. No? I think we have been putting the world upside down little by little and perhaps we didn't realize so much on how grave is the situation today. No? Yeah, but. You know, for when I look at the, the political um, map, if you will, in Europe in particular, uh, we see a European uh, institution, the European Union, which is predominantly ruled by the left, to a certain degree, even by the radical left, if we look at mm -hmm. uh, some angles within that. And uh, for years, the conservative parties and, and the conservative right parties have not really provided an alternative for European citizens to come and say, no, but yeah. we are looking for that alternative and, and provide us that alternative so we can pursue that. Uh, it was always going along with reality and even, sadly, I must add, um, parties, for instance, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Tories, uh, which are supposed to be conservative, they're not conservative at all. They yeah. were passing through uh, legislation all of the liberal values, the liberal left values uh, that have uh, uh, been challenging the conservative ideals and, and values for so many years. Yeah, that's true, because I think the conservative uh, parties, the traditional conservative parties, has been replaced slowly but progressively by center-right neoliberal parties, which um, has put the emphasis on the economic aspect of the life, mm. uh, losing the sight of that we are, yes, economic actors, but we also have a soul and we have a morals and, uh, inside us. No? We are much more than just buyers and, and, and consumers. And so they have become materialistic, mm. forgetting about all the other aspects of life. No? Uh, for them, in, pro in practical terms, being in power means a good management of the economy, of a national economy, reducing debt, reducing taxes, and that they are happy with that. While the left has been increasingly active in education, where the values are instilled in our kids, in, in taking the moral ground, 
from the artist uh, communities and all these kind of uh, uh, groups which have an impact on, on young people and many people no? because they are famous uh, and, uh, and also focusing on those elements where it's basic cultural war no? family, demographics uh, gender uh, all those issues which are not addressed at all by the center right in, in Europe and in the world in general no? unless you are a society which is slightly different, like Israel, where you have a common ground of common religions. You are a young uh, uh, country. People, the demographics here are different from the rest of the world, thanks God. Uh, but in the rest, I think uh, this lack of vision of the cultural world has condemned us to 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 be under the, the gui cultural guidance of the left everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, moreover, when we're looking at countries like Hungary and Poland, for that matter, who have been the champions of the conservative values within uh, the European constellation, they have been targeted, attacked time and again for being yeah. racist, for being um, even worse than that, just because they say, no, we do not want those values. Our population is not interested in replacing our uh, uh, Christian foundation and our understandings of the way society is supposed to function and they're being attacked for this this is yeah. happening the same in in spain with uh, uh the parties to the right who are seeking those values to re-emerge elsewhere as well is this expected to intensify as the conservative right is once again re-emerging uh within the political scene well, I think uh, in Europe we have seen an increasing number of people moving away from the institutional right to the new to the new right or the alternative right, or whatever you want to call it, uh, from Spain to Germany. Parties from Vox in Spain to Alliance for, the, for Germany. Uh, we have seen Orban Party as a central piece of uh, defending our values and our, our civilization. But the fact is that a, a generation, an entire generation, has been educated in something quite new: is in the self-hatred. Hatred. Many people in our countries hate ourselves for something that we didn't do any, in the past, or they believe that, that we have to be blamed for historical records like 500 years ago, the discovery of America by Cristobal Colón, no? and now they are taking down their their statues in the United States. No, I think we we need to say stop. Uh, history is not going in that in that direction, or shouldn't be going in that direction. And Orban and the Polish government has been playing a central role in trying to defend borders, keeping emigra illegal immigration outside, uh, defending the the primacy of our citizenship. I mean, when a country doesn't make any difference between an Spaniard and a, a foreigner, what's the what was the, the identity what's of the, the nationality? What's the point? Mm. Uh, so I think we, the left has taken a lot of power in that sense, no? contaminating most of the traditional center-right parties in Europe. And, uh, but uh, I see as, as a growing reaction to that, and I'm hopeful that uh, uh, if there are leaders strong enough to keep this direction, we will change the situation in the future. Is there good leadership at this stage, or are we still searching for the right individual who will ultimately... Um, relay the, the true foundations in such a way that uh, people will be able to uh, relate to and, and follow to a certain degree? Well, I would like to, to be hopeful and say, yes, there will be or there are leaders already. Unfortunately, history makes me prudent. No, You have seen many collapses of civilization in the past, and maybe we are already too late and condemned to disappear as such. You know? Uh, but I think, uh, in any case, we need to do the, the, the last and final battle. I don't know if we will be the conquerors or will be the 300 people of Leonidas in the Thermopylae. But uh, if we don't fight, we are dead. So we need to we need to counter react to this emerging and powerful trend that has been dominated by the left. You know? This is, of course, uh, a battle to the death of. of Ultimately, those values that are under attack time and again. Uh, let me ask you, you mentioned migration. Obviously, every time that uh, the, the uh, conservative, the right uh, parties raise uh, the issue of illegal migration with yeah. emphasis on illegal, yeah. 
they're dubbed as racist. Yep. Well, where does that come from? Isn't that uh, the whole point of the, the government, of the institutions, to make sure that whatever is illegal is being uh, persecuted in a society of rules and order? Yeah, well, you know, the critical uh, race theory born in the American universities condemned all whiteness just because of being white. So many people have adopted the ramification of that uh, theory saying, okay, if you are against illegal immigrants or immigrants, it's because you are racist. No, I don't have any problem with races or color. Uh, I have problem with people who doesn't understand our culture and doesn't want to become one of us. Uh, also because they are entering illegally in, in our countries. Uh, they cannot be treated as the people who has been applying through a long and costly process of being legally accepted, or those who have assimilated because they wanted to be part of our economy. Yeah, I'll give you an example. In Spain, uh, almost 70% of the illegal immigrants are not employed. So people who are thinking in this re re replacement theory that they are going to we need the immigrants because we are not able to pay our pensions. It's ridiculous. Economically, it's unsustainable. So I think it's because, yeah, you, as you mentioned, you pointed as a racist and you, you have a, this kind of a stigma in your, in your forehead. No? Uh, but we need to be realistic. I mean, this process of bo open borders uh, is unsustainable. Either you kill the welfare state or you kill the national identities. Or both at the end. Indeed. Well, let's uh, look a little bit on on this region here. We are in Jerusalem, of course, and and uh, unfortunately, we're at a time when there is a lot of doubt, a lot of uh, instability, also from a political perspective, but also from a security perspective. We're seeing uh, the uh, re-emerging talks uh, of the nuclear deal with Iran in taking place in Doha, uh, Qatar. Is this something that, uh, in uh, your opinion, um, will challenge Israel even further? Well, I think what is clear is that Iran is not giving up anything. So whether the new agreement on the nuclear program is achieved or not, uh, I think is irrelevant in that, in that sense. Whatever is signed, it will be in favor of the Ayatollah's regime uh, and their nuclear ambitions. And even if they don't develop the, finally a nuclear weapon, which is, is doubtful because they have been trying to do so for decades, they will have money enough to instill um, the hate against Israel from the north to the south. They will pay for any proxy to, to attack Israelis everywhere uh, in the world, and uh, that will increase the insecurity of the state of Israel. Uh, if at the end of the process Iran is even a nuclear power, that will be a game changer you know, for, for the whole region, not only Israel, and for the world. No? Uh, it will be a revolutionary bomb, it will be a Shia bomb, and will be a Persian bomb, all of three together, which all the ambition of an imperial power. So if I were in Saudi Arabia or in Kuwait or in the Emirates, as in Israel, I would be very concerned with an emerging nuclear arsenal in Iran. Indeed. And uh, when we're looking at uh, uh, the United States and, and uh, uh, the West at large today, uh, we're seeing uh, the champions or self-proclaimed champions of human rights not really caring at all uh, for the, the people of Iran who are currently being suppressed by this Ayatollah regime. How, how is this contrast of, yeah. of perception? I, mean, I remember very sadly the events, all the revolt that took place a few years ago under Obama and the West looked at the other side. No, instead of helping the opposition and the people on the streets just condemned them to the oppression of the Ayatollah's regime. No? Uh, at the same time, the economy is still in very bad shape. Uh, if it continues to do so, I think that there are ferments of uh, dissension in, 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 in Iran. I'm not saying that the regime change around the corner, but we need to be sensible and sensitive to those who are opposing the, the regime and try to help them because that will be another way to alleviate the tension with, uh, with Iran. Is enough being done? No, not at all. I no. think much more should have been done in support of the different groups and the people. 
definitely. Let's move to uh, Israel's northern neighbor, Syria. We, of course, have seen since 2011 uh, the uprising that turned into a bloody civil war, which was then utilized uh, by uh, world powers as an international pr playground, pretty yeah. much. Uh, of course, this was also in Iraq and elsewhere. But when we focus uh, right now on, on Syria, to what degree is Russia's uh, placement in Syria, the entrenchment there, uh, as well as the Iranian entrenchment, uh, challenging not only Israel, but the West at large and uh, also the region in particular? Well, I think uh, every Israeli woke up one day with a superpower in the border, you know, which never happened in the past, which is something different, obviously, particularly when Israel has to defend itself against any potential attacks from Syria. Uh, the presence of the, of the Russians in Syria uh, is a mixed uh, situation. On the one hand, yes, it's a superpower over there, but their interest also in the reconstruction of the country runs against the ambitions of uh, the Iranians. So it's, it's not it's not a clear cut game. No, uh, that's why they don't they don't they won't push for the Iranian out of the country definitely, but they will try to get a bigger part of the cake. Mm -hmm. uh, so there will be tensions over there. But uh, what is obvious is that after so many years of civil war, when we discarded Bashar al-Assad as the leader in, in Damascus, we have to deal with him because he's, he's the real uh, winner of this uh, of this civil war, unfortunately. You know? Indeed, unfortunate. Uh, we don't have very much time left, so I want to touch on one more topic, and that is the energy crisis yeah. in Europe. Of course, uh, the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, other than the atrocities committed on the ground, uh, is impacting the global market. Uh, the uh, 155 billion uh, cubic meters of natural gas, uh, uh, which is no longer uh, being uh, pumped into Europe, used to constitute some 33%. Now, the majority is being pumped from or LNG being ferried yeah. to Europe uh, uh, from the United States. Secondary then, of course, uh, is Qatar, mm. uh, which uh, made agreements with Spain, uh, mm. made an agreement with Germany, uh, quite substantive mm. agreements, as well yeah. as Israel. Uh, but while we understand the implications to a certain degree of Qatar making that agreement, uh, and of course, also uh, the quantities coming from the United States. When we look at Israel uh, being the third party of uh, MOU signed between uh, the EU in particular with Israel and Egypt, is this uh, something that can further bolster cooperation between Israel and Europe on the one hand, but also to what degree does it challenge its relations with Russia on the other? Well, I think, uh, yes, in case of need, the Europeans will put aside all the criticism of Israel if we can get the gas out of the Mediterranean. Uh, but I, I think the situation in which we are, uh, energy speaking, is because of our own decision. It's because Angela Merkel closed the nuclear power in Germany and then followed uh, many other countries. And because of the European Union put the carbon uh, factories outside the, the picture, if we were recovering some of those potential, we will be almost independent from anyone else uh, outside of Europe. No? So I think we need to rethink not only supplies outside the European Union, but changing the rule of the game and bring back the nuclear power and carbon power, power plant. And with regard to the Russian angle? To the Russian, in that case, uh, I think uh, we, we are openly now in Europe uh, trying to, to diminish our dependence on the gas from Russia. And nothing is going to change that. Indeed, yeah. To consider, of course, that Israel's uh, CBMs or uh, uh, BCM, sorry, the billion uh, cubic meters of uh, LNG amount from 5% by the end of the year to 7 uh, uh, BCM, and then they want to double that next year. Is, is that really viable through this uh, route? Probably not. Probably not. I think... Uh, I think the, the first lesson we have to have to take is that, okay, all those dreams about the uh, Agenda 2030, about becoming green and everything, are gone, are gone, unless we want to go back to the Middle, Middle Ages. Yesterday, NATO, in the summit, in Madrid summit, released a document about this, the climate change. I mean, that's a totally woke uh, proposition. We need to face reality in that sense. If we don't want to spend a winter freezing at home, we need to revive our sources. 
solar, wind, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, it has to be nuclear and carbon because mm -hmm. that's the only which can produce the quantity we are consuming. Well, we have uh, roughly two minutes left, and I'd like uh, our viewers to get uh, some insight uh, from your perspective. What are the things that uh, our TV7 community or TV7 family should focus on uh, at this stage? Also from a Christian perspective, as they pray for the situation, I really want to stand up for those values that we spoke of. I think we need to understand that we have challenges challenges from abroad, like uh, Russia and Europe and China globally, but that our main enemies today is inside us, and we need to fight and stand up against those who are in favor of dissolving the families, in favor, in favor of stealing the wrong values to our kids through education, from the schools to the colleges. And we need really to, to increase our pressure on our politicians to be aware that the woke society, the ultra-left cultural society, is not something uh, that we want, and it's something that will lead to a ruin, a dissolution as a society. I, I absolutely agree. I, I think that one of the things that we tend to do, uh, all of us, and we all have failed in this manner, is to look the other way when part of the agenda aligns with our own. Yeah. We need to see the whole agenda, make sure that the whole agenda is addressed rather than just part of what those politicians who represent us yeah. within democratic societies, they are in office representing our voice, our beliefs, our, our understanding and comprehension of, of the way things should uh, head forward. And if they're willing to take only part of that, of course, they need to think of all of society. In a holistic way. But it, it doesn't uh, work in a holistic way. If they want the support of all of us, we need to stand for everything. Thank you so much, Rafael, for being part of Thank uh, you for having me program, here today. As always. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. Uh, God bless you. And we will see you next time for yet another episode of TV7 Editor's Note. Shalom. TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.